Now, there are fears that the coronavirus outbreak could become a pandemic. We now know there are confirmed cases in 35 countries. It's already classed as an epidemic, but here's an update from the BBC's medical correspondent, Fergus Walsh, saying the combined situation in South Korea, Iran and Italy point to the early stages of a pandemic, a pandemic being when a disease has spread worldwide. Here's the assessment of the World Health Organization. This is not the time to focus on what word we use. That will not prevent a single infection today or save a single life today. This is a time for all countries, communities, families and individuals to focus on preparing. We do not live in a binary black and white world. It's not either or. We must focus on containment while doing everything we can to prepare for a potential pandemic. Well, look at these statistics. The coronavirus has overtaken the 2003 SARS epidemic and the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome, MERS, in both the number of cases by far and also the number of deaths too. The SARS outbreak lasted around eight months. Here's the WHO again on why it is very difficult to put a time frame on this virus. What we don't know is what the reality will be in two months or in six months' time. There, uh, there is still uh, a possibility that we can contain the virus and interrupt its, trans interrupt its transmission, uh, but uh, the virus may settle down into an endemic pattern of transmission, into a seasonal pattern of transmission, or could accelerate into a, a full-blown global uh, pandemic and at this point uh, it is not possible to say which of those realities uh, is going to is going to happen well Italy is one of the countries where numbers are escalating there's been a fifth death today there have been more than 200 new cases since Friday several towns in Lombardy and in Veneto are on lockdown that means around 50,000 people cannot leave without permission and you'll see how that's working in these pictures this is a police roadblock that's been set up to stop people moving in or out. This is just outside a town called Casalpus de Lengo. If you go a little bit further north, well, this is a train heading through the Alps, but it was stopped from crossing from Italy into Austria because two passengers were suspected of having the virus. Hours later, they'd tested negative and the train was able to continue. Next, these pictures are from Milan. Just look at these empty shelves. That's because people have been stocking up on food and supplies. They want to be ready in case a lockdown is imposed here too. And already the city is taking different types of action. Its famous cathedrals being closed, as have some schools and some universities. Well, let's focus on one town that is locked down, the town of Codono, just to the southeast of Milan. And the BBC's Mark Lowen is just outside it. Well, this is the exclusion zone now on the road to Codogno, the centre of the outbreak. And you can see they're stopping all the cars trying to enter here and all those trying to leave. Depends whether they've got the, they've got the authorization as to whether they can pass through. And the Carabinieri and military are deciding whether or not to widen this exclusion zone in an attempt to control the coronavirus spread. And Mark's been using his phone to speak to some of the residents who are stuck on the other side of that barrier. We feel a bit abandoned. The news we get comes through WhatsApp or Facebook. There's a lot of false rumors around. Are people panicked? Yes, people are panicking. Some convince themselves it will blow over. Others are worried and can't sleep. And this perspective, one school teacher, also in a town which is locked down, called San Fiorano. We can take walks, we can walk our dogs, we can go jogging, we can ride bikes, but authorities suggested to us to avoid contact with other people. We know that we may be infected and that we may already have contracted the coronavirus and we wait for these days to pass by living day by day. If these symptoms appear, we know what we have to do, hoping that the emergency numbers are free to call, because from what I know, it is really difficult to contact the health professionals. So we've heard from Codogno, we've heard from San Fiorano. It's got a little bit further south, just outside the lockdown area, to a place called Piacenza, and the BBC's Bethany Bell is there.
Well, certainly there is a lot of concern. We've been wandering around Piacenza today, uh, people concerned about uh, the possible spread of this. They don't know how long quarantine in neighbouring towns is going to last for. We're just a, a few kilometres away from the exclusion zone here. A lot of the cafes and restaurant owners that we've spoken to here say they're worried about the impact on their business. Uh, very few people out and about. And in some areas a bit closer to the exclusion zone, um, the cafes and restaurants are completely shut. Well, let's move from Italy to South Korea. It has the largest number of infections outside of China, over 830. And most of those are linked to a religious group in the city of Daegu, right in the south of South Korea. This was the scene on Monday. Just look at how many people are in this queue. It's outside a supermarket and all of these people want to buy surgical masks and other supplies. Well, the BBC's Laura Bicker has been in Daegu over the weekend. Here she explains how technology is being used in an effort to restrict this virus. They're using your phone to locate where you are and then they'll send you an emergency alert if you're anywhere near where a confirmed coronavirus patient has been. Well, let's shift now from South Korea to the Middle East because we have a number of new infections and deaths across the region in Afghanistan, Oman, Bahrain, Kuwait and Iraq as well, all reporting their first cases. We know that those cases are linked to a cluster of cases in Iran, centered around the religious city of Qom, which is just to the south of Tehran. It's visited by millions of Shia Muslim pilgrims every year. Here's Rana Rahimpour from BBC Persian on what we know about what's happening in the city. They are introducing some measures about the security in the shrine, the shrine that, uh, a Shia shrine there, and they, say, they said that there won't be any um, uh, public prayers anymore for a while and they put some some uh, f uh, fences between the shrine so people don't touch it but the problem is that uh, they, they are lacking infrastructure and they're lacking accurate reporting. Well let's look at that last point because the official death toll in Iran is currently 13 but a parliamentarian who represents Com is claiming that the true figure is at least 50 in the city alone and he's accusing the authorities of lying about the extent of the problem. The deputy health minister has responded saying if the number of deaths in Com reaches half or a quarter of this figure, I will resign. But that local parliamentarian has responded, I've given the names of 40 dead people to the deputy minister. Now we await his resignation. Well, here's Rana again. At least in seven provinces in Iran, there have been confirmed cases of coronavirus, and many of them are religious hotbeds. So, for instance, the city of Mashhad, which uh, hosts one of the uh, shrines of the, of the Shias, um, that is open. Mm -hmm. And the, the authorities haven't even confirmed any cases in Mashhad. But we know that Kuwait, that evacuated 700 p uh, of its people, have confirmed that there were three cases uh, that had come from Iran. But that shrine is open. Tonight, thousands of people are celebrating a Shia, Shia um, celebration and they are just next to each other celebrating this event. It's unbelievable how many people are there while we know that there is coronavirus. And how are you and your colleagues at BBC Persian getting good information about the virus inside Iran, given that it's hard to get good information on anything connected to the government? It's very difficult. The numbers that we, he we hear from our viewers is far more than what the Iranian authorities are, con are confirming. And there are, it's, it's a, a serious concern because they say 61 confirmed cases and 13 um, people have died. Mm -hmm. But what people are telling me is far more than that. And when the ratio between the confirmed cases and deaths it's much higher than the rest of the world so it's about uh, nearly 20 percent of people have been killed so that it, this shows that there's lack of transparency as a result people are very worried and they can't trust anything that the authorities are saying and we have other cases elsewhere in the middle east we think connected to the outbreak in Iran. So are there any restrictions on movement between Iran and other neighboring countries? Most neighbors have closed down their borders and, and they, they have suspended their flights to several cities in Iran. And remember, because the city of Rome is a religious city, Mashhad is a religious city, they have many foreign pilgrims there. And in the city of Rome, there is a seminary, what the most important Shia seminary there. So there are many Shia students there who have then traveled back to their countries. That's why it has quit quickly spread in, in many of the Muslim countries in the region. Now, this crisis is very much a global of concern, of course, but China very much remains at its center. These are the latest statistics on the situation there. Over 77,000 confirmed cases, over 2,500 deaths. And China's government's now taken the hugely symbolic decision 
of postponing its annual parliamentary gathering. That's the National People's Congress. It was due to take place in Beijing next month. Stephen McDonald's there. This is the most important political gathering of the year. And to be putting it off, uh, you know, it really will make everybody <laughs> pay attention in China, certainly. I mean, it, it would have been, you'd have to go back to the, probably the Cultural Revolution for the last time that the National People's Congress didn't go ahead as planned at the right time. But, you know, you can understand why. Imagine 3,000 delegates all coming to Beijing from across the country, including from Hubei province, which is at the heart of the problem. Now, apart from potentially getting infected themselves, some of them could be carrying the coronavirus into the Great Hall of the People, where China's senior leadership are, where the, you know, the heads of the military, uh, business leaders and the like are all at that gathering. Now, imagine potentially infecting all of those people with a, this, this disease, which can be deadly. So Stephen, with a political dimension to the story, next is John Sudworth, also in Beijing, with an update on what China is doing to combat the spread of the virus more broadly. China is going all out to contain the virus. This is an infection control squad in training. But there are still questions over its early response and the silencing of medics who tried to raise the alarm. Today, though, the World Health Organization was full of praise. China has rolled out probably the most ambitious and I would say agile and aggressive uh, disease containment effort in history. To what extent do you think cover-up and censorship played a role in allowing this virus to accelerate at the rate it did? I don't know. Frankly, didn't, didn't look at that. I'm, I'm just being completely honest. But what worries me most is, has the rest of the world learned the lesson of speed? Once China woke up to the danger, it did move fast, quarantining cities and effectively shutting down its economy. As the virus was allowed to spiral out of control in the province of Hubei, it spread in smaller but significant pockets to every province in China. This is the picture of a disaster and it forced the government to act. And here's what happened. The official figures show that in Hubei, although the numbers are still high, they are stabilizing. And for the rest of China, even better news. The numbers kept low by those containment measures. And if we have a closer look, for more than a week now, they've been falling. China's been so effective, the World Health Organization says, it's now safe to get the economy going again. Welcome news on this farm. With the roads all blocked, of course it's brought sales down, Wei Hongkun tells me. If China's control of information helped start the crisis, its control over its people might help solve it. John Sudworth, BBC News, Beijing. Almost every day we're doing these comprehensive roundups of the coronavirus crisis. And if you want to watch any of them back, you can get it in the UK via iPlayer, but wherever you are in the world via the BBC News YouTube channel.